Hello, I'm Michael Brown, President of the School for Advanced Research in Santa Fe, New Mexico. It's my great pleasure to introduce today's lecture by Dr. Glenn H. Shepard, Jr. Before I introduce Dr. Shepard, let me explain a little bit about the circumstance. You can tell from my virtual background uh, that I am not at SAR. Um, SAR is closed, as are all other institutions in the state of New Mexico by order of the governor in response to the coronavirus emergency. Um, Glenn Shepard himself is in Washington, D.C., not at New in New York, teaching at Columbia University, which is where he's visiting this semester. Throughout this situation, SAR is going to be working tirelessly to take those events that were scheduled to be public events in Santa Fe, bring them to the web in a form that can be enjoyed by our members and our future members and all members of the public. Um, the support and involvement of our members is welcome more than ever as we carry out our mission to promote creative thought and deliver quality content relevant to today's world. We're particularly grateful to those individuals, foundations, and businesses who've supported SAR's Creative Thought Forum lecture series for this year. These include the Palo Jaime Foundation, John Camp and Michelle Cook, Patty and Arthur Newman through the Newman's Own Foundation, Adobo Catering, Baharito Scientific Corporation, Thornburg Investment Management, the Flora Crichton Lecture Fund, and the Ethel Jane Westfeld Bunting Foundation. I'd also like to thank the sponsors for this particular lecture, who are Shiprock Santa Fe, Santa Fe Dining, First National 1870 Bank, and Walter Burke Catering. Finally, I'd like to acknowledge the tireless support of our board of directors and the members of SAR's Founder Society who make the Creative Thought Forum events possible. Glenn Shepard is a graduate of Princeton University. He received his doctorate from the University of California, Berkeley in a joint program with UC San Francisco. He's a distinguished medical anthropologist and ethnobotanist with expertise in the indigenous people of Brazil and Peru, Amazonian general, but especially Peru and Brazil. He has an appointment at the Guelgi Museum in Belém, Brazil. He's currently a visiting professor of anthropology at Columbia University and working on a project with the American Museum of Natural History in New York. Um, his blog, Notes from the Ethnoground, is, I think, one of the most exciting and best written anthropology blogs anywhere in the world. And I encourage you to take a look at it at your first opportunity. Um, before I do a handoff to Glenn, I just want to mention that uh, we would welcome questions from viewers. They can be directed to the comments box under the video. We'd be grateful if you can indicate where you're visiting us from. Tell me where you're located. That helps us figure out who we're reaching in this process. We may not be able to take all the questions, but we'll take three or four before we end. And uh, we look forward to doing this. We ask your patience as we work through this complex um, technology, which has all of us in a number of different places. But we think you'll enjoy it. And uh, I look forward to hearing your questions at the end. Good evening, everyone. My name is Glenn Shepard. I'm an anthropologist, originally from the US, now based in Brazil. And uh, I'd like to thank the School for Advanced Research for this invitation. Uh, I've never, I've, it, it's a place that I've always wanted to visit. I've never been in Santa Fe. I've all, uh, the School for Advanced Research has a, has a long and storied um, history. And I'm really, really disappointed I wasn't able to make it personally, but in these um, times of crisis, we all have to, um, have to adapt to the, to the situation. So we're doing this lecture by video conferencing. I would like to thank Michael Brown for the kind invitation uh, and for his work through the years and inspiration. And also thank uh, Meredith and Garrett for all the technical support in setting this up. So I'm going to be talking about um, my experience working in Brazil with the Kayapo indigenous peoples um, on a topic that's not perhaps not the, the most uh, typical anthropological topic. I'm going to be work, talking about how the Kayapo have uh, have used video in their in their in their struggles to uh, to get their their rights and uh, to express their culture. The Kayapo people are indigenous uh, people of Brazil. 
Uh, they number today about 12,000 people. They live in between the Brazilian states of Pará, southern Pará, and northern Mato Grosso. So it's on the fringe areas of the Amazon. And, uh, but curiously enough, the Kayapo people, today they inhabit the Amazon and they are considered perhaps the quintessential Amazonian peoples. But um, at the time of uh, European colonization, they actually did not live in the Amazon at all. They lived in the Cejado, the dry forests to the south of the Amazon. And it was only because of Western colonization, the Portuguese colonization, that they were pushed forward into the Amazon region from the Cejado region. And so they've, they've been one of the great success stories in, 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 in indigenous resistance and the fact that they've, they've been forced into this new environment, the Amazon, and they adapted uh, their culture uh, to that rainforest environment and they sort of took over and captured the technology and the knowledge they needed to survive in the Amazon from their neighbors and enemies as they moved into the, into the Shingu River. The Kayapo people, um, they, they have been at the forefront of uh, indigenous uh, people's political activism in the Amazon for many years. And in fact, uh, in, in 1990, the Kayapo, uh, a group of Kayapo warriors, uh, Kubei and Tapiet, visited the American Museum of Natural History in 1990. And they were there to visit, uh, they, were, they were with anthropologist uh, Terence Turner, a very well-known uh, uh, Kayapo expert who passed away recently. And uh, they, were, they were in New York to visit, they were on the, they were, it was during the time when the Kayapo people were protesting the Belomonchi Dam, the, the dam that the World Bank was initially gonna finance. And because of, largely because of the Kayapo's um, activism and organization, that dam was, uh, was not funded by the World Bank and was only more recently uh, funded and built by the Brazilian government a few years back. Um, and so because the Kayapo and were, were in New York, um, the curator of the American Museum, the anthropology, the South American curator for the American Museum, uh, Robert Carnero, was very eager for the Kayapo visitors with Terence Sterner to visit the, the, the recently, he, he just put up a, an exhibit, 1988, Robert Conero had just put up an exhibit about Amazonian peoples. And there's a very prominent uh, Kayapo warrior uh, mannequin in the exhibit. And, um, and so he invited the, these two Kayapo men, Tapiet and Kubei, to visit the exhibit and say, have, have a chance to see it. And Robert Carnero has told me that he was a bit apprehensive about this visit because at least in those days in the 1980s, when a curator set up an exhibit about indigenous peoples, it wasn't common for those peoples to actually come and visit it. So he was, he was a bit concerned of this representation of this fierce Kaipo warrior holding the war club with the lip plug, how they would react to that, whether they felt they were being represented in a way that was, uh, that was distorted or unfair. And actually the Kaipo loved it. Um, Terence Turner was there to translate, and th th they said, this is exactly the way we want to be seen, as fierce warriors defending our lands. And they said, but however, he's missing a headdress, and he's missing a necklace. And so the two men, Kubei and, Kubei and Tapiet, they took off, uh, Tapiet took off the feather crown that he was wearing and placed it on the mannequin. And, um, and I, I believe Kubei took off some ear ornaments and placed it on the mannequin. And so they, they, they said, this is the way we want to be represented, but you're missing a few pieces. And so they placed it on the, on the mannequin. And to this day, those, um, those pieces of Kaipo uh, body ornamentation are on this mannequin. Um, and I'm actually, this semester, until <laughs> the coronavirus outbreak, I was working in the American Museum to make a new exhibit talking about the, the way the Kayapos have evolved in their, in their use of media and so on. That exhibit will probably be supposed to be open in May. We'll see what happens with that now. So, um, why isn't it advancing? Um, so the Kayapo have had this long engagement with, um, with, uh, with the media as a way of defending their territory and their cultural rights and their political rights in Brazil. Uh, Terence Turner had, when he, when he took the two Kaipo to visit uh, the American Museum in 1991, he had recently made a film called Out of the Forest um, about the Kaipo struggles to, against the Belomonchi Dam and their, their struggles to maintain their territories. And, um, and as part of this um, larger protest movement, 
um, Terrence Turner helped the Kayapo acquire video cameras for the first time. They were, Grenada Films was making the film about this land struggle and the Kayapo were very interested in getting their own video cameras. Um, and there's an iconic image of, uh, there was, a, there was a, in 1988, there was a large protest movement in Altamira in the state of Pará, near where the dam was eventually built, in which the Kayapo and other forest people, peoples gathered together to protest to representatives of the Brazilian government and the Brazilian power company. And this is a very famous picture of the Kayapo female chief, Tuide, um, shaking a machete in the face of this representative of the Brazilian power company that was gonna build the dam. And this image sort of stood out in the media as being a, a, an iconic representation of the Kayapo people's uh, resistance to uh, uh, this, these development projects and their and their, their, uh, their, their capacity to organize and to project their image as a warrior people to defend their lands. And, and with this film, Out of the Forest, uh, the Kayapo people, they, uh, they began to understand the power of media and cameras um, in defending their, their political and cultural rights and land rights. And so during this film, the Kayapo people were given, and they were, they were given video cameras and they were trained to use video cameras and what they did is they went to visit existing dam sites in Brazil and they filmed the devastation in these dams and they brought, brought those images back to the Kayapo villages to show to the people to say, this is what's gonna happen to our land if we're allowed to build this dam. And this, this use of sort of a kind of, uh, a kind of um, uh, primitive video, video conferencing, you know, they were, they were looking at remote images of a place that they had never visited a few cameramen visited, brought the images back, and when they realized how bad these dams were going to be, that helped them mobilize for this uh, for this big meeting in Altamira that led to that eventually led to the World Bank canceling the um, canceling the, the funding for the project. And so, so the Kayapo have really been um, at the forefront of what is now known as indigenous media. They have been at the forefront of learning to use video technology, appropriating that technology for their own cultural purposes. And, and Terrence Turner, our dear departed friend, has written a lot about how the Kayapo have appropriated technology and how they've projected their, their image as warriors to defend their lands. And we see that these same, you know, this same tendency goes through the very present day. Um, you know, there's the famous photograph of Tuide, um, threatening the, the Kayapo, I mean, <laughs> threatening the, uh, the, the Brazilian um, power company uh, represented with the machete. And to this day, in the center of the photo, you see Tuida lecturing a group of visitors. I was among a group of visitors to her village uh, two, three years ago. And she was lecturing us about the dangers of gold mining, the dangers of the, the dams and so on, the ongoing, the ongoing dangers. And then in 2019, to the, to the left side of your screen, there's Chief Ngre Kamoro. She's the chief, she's a female chief. There are, um, it, it's not common among the Kaipo, but there are several standout female chiefs who, have, who are leading in this struggle, like Tuida in the 1980s. And Ngre Kamoro, in an interview with the Financial Times in, uh, in, in 2019, um, with, the, with the, the newly arrived Bolsonaro administration and all the threats that they were representing to indigenous peoples, this, this uh, female chief, Mary Camoro, held up when, when, when the, the journalist, Andres Chipani, for the Financial Times, asked her um, what would she do about Bolsonaro if he continued to denigrate indigenous peoples. She grabbed her machete and said, I'll cut his mouth off. So we see that the Kayapo have this, uh, they've had this long-term constant engagement with, uh, with, with the media as a way of promoting their rights. And, the, the, and, and video has been a very important part of this very early on. Um, there, with the, during, the, during Terrence Turner's work on the Grenada Project, there were three, there were a total of three Kayapo um, cameramen, at that point there were only Kayapo cameramen, male cameramen, who were trained. And Mokuka was one of, the, one of the first ones, and he was actually in the, he was in the Brazilian House of Congress in 1988, this image on the left, he was filming the, the signing of the Brazilian constitution. It's a very famous scene where the indigenous peoples are present at the, at the, the arguments over the constitution to make sure indigenous land rights are part of the constitution. And Mokuka was there filming it. And then there's an image down below of Mokuka 
um, in his new career as a Kaipo pop singer, which we will talk about later on in the, in the, in the, in the talk. And then Kia Beti, who was a very close friend of anthropologist Terence Turner, um, three years ago, he was recognized in an international award uh, for his ongoing work as a video warrior. And in the interview, he did an interview for National Geographic where he, he explained that the Kayapo people see the video camera as a kind of weapon that they use to defend themselves. So my involvement with the Kayapo is much more recent. I, I've worked in different parts of the Amazon, in the Peruvian Amazon for many years. And then in 2009, I was hired at the Gelde Museum in Belén. And um, I'd never, you know, I'd read a lot about the Kayapo and they were, they're sort of a, they're, un, they're, they're, this, they're this force of nature in, in indigenous politics in Brazil. They're always on TV. They're, you know, they're, this, they're, this, they're this incredibly uh, colorful people with these amazing um, ceremonies and so on. So there were people that I had I'd read about and I'd seen a lot in the media, but I never worked with them. And then when I came to the Gelder Museum in 2009, I was, um, I was called on to become the curator of the of the, of the ethnographic collections in the absence, the, 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 the curator for many years was on leave in Brasilia because her husband had taken over the, the directorship of the Brazilian Indigenous uh, Foundation, Funai. And so I was sort of the interim curator of these collections. And within the first two months of my curatorship, a large group of Kayapo showed up in the collections to visit it with a French, a French anthropologist who'd worked with them, Pascal de, Ribor, de Robert. And they, they, they visited the collections and they very much enjoyed their visit. And they came to me and they said, we want you to help us come back and visit the collections, but we need cameras and we need training so that we can record what's going on here and show to the people in the villages and also make films. Because you know, in the museum, we're very appreciative that you have kept these Kaipo artifacts for all these hundred, you know, hundred or so years since they've been collected, but we want people to know that we still make these artifacts and we still have our rituals. We haven't lost any of this stuff. It's in the museum, but just because it's in the museum doesn't mean that we've forgotten it. And so, so they literally came to me and said, will you train us to make films and come to our villages and help us film the villages? And I said, of course. I mean, that's sort of the anthropologist's dream. Rather than showing up in a village and saying, here's what I want to do, the chief comes to you and your office in, in the university and says, come work with us. So that's how I got involved with the Kayapo. And I'm still learning the language. I'm still learning the culture. It's a very complex culture. But at this point, I've been working with the Kayapo about 10 years. And so, um, you know, the, the, the initial project was about, we have this large collection of Kayapo objects in the museum, in the Gelder Museum in Belém. And one of the earliest collections in the, in the museum was a group of Kaipo objects collected in 1902 by a Catholic priest, Frey, uh, Frey Gilles de Villanova. He was, a, he was a priest who was working with the Kaipo in the early, uh, early 20th century. And he sold a large collection of objects to the Kaipo, uh, to the Gelder Museum in the early 20th century to support his missionary work. And the group that Frey Gilles collected among and worked with is called the Ira Amurai, the Kayapo people. They're, 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 there's a single cultural group known as Kayapo, but in that group, there are many different villages and languages and subgroups that, um, that in the past were at war with each other sometimes. And one of those subgroups was called the Ira Amurai. And they, they basically went culturally extinct because of epidemics and because of integration. They were near a small Brazilian town. Um, and, and Conceição da Araguaia, and basically they, they went extinct as a cultural group soon after this, uh, this visit to the museum. And so in a way, the, the, these Ira Amarari objects in the collection are the last sort of material vestiges of this people. And during their visit, they were photographed, and around the museum park, there are these sort of ghostly life-size photos of the these Ara, Ara Marairi, Kayapo people who visited the Gelde in 1902. And, and I couldn't resist taking the photograph of the Kayapo people today standing alongside this hundred year old ghost of, of the same cultural group. So um, the Kayapo, curiously enough, at the time that the Kayapo came to visit us in the collections, it coincided with the swine flu outbreak in um, 2019. And now we're going through something uh, quite similar, perhaps uh, arguably much worse today. And so 
when the Kaipo first came into contact with the museum collections, they were very wary about the odor. When you go into the collections uh, deposit, there's, 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 we have dehumidifiers that are working and there's a smell of sort of dried, like dried palm leaves because there's a lot of, there's a lot of palm fibers in there. So there's this sort of unusual smell. And, um, and they were very concerned about the, this odor, which they thought was a representation of the owners of these objects. When, when the Kaipo die, their, many of their um, most prestigious objects, such as their feather crowns and their, these necklaces that you can see in the photograph, their satellite TV antenna, their beds, the sports trophies that, they, that have been won in their village, all of, the, all of the things are piled on top of their grave. Um, and the idea is that the dead person sort of takes these material objects with them. Um, and in, in this collection space where these, these objects from all these, you know, hundreds of cultures and these old objects, they, the odor for them was a representation of this, of, of the spirit, the owners of these dead people. They, they were a bit worried about it. But when they saw that we had Matt, and they, they just traveled, they were just traveling through Brazil, through airports and bus stations and so on. And they were seeing on the news that everyone was wearing surgical masks to protect themselves from the H1N1, the swine flu virus. And so they figured since these are sort of standard part, the, glo the rubber gloves and the masks were available in, to our museum staff when they're handling fragile objects, they decided that, um, that the, if it protects them against swine flu, it could protect them against these old uh, spirits of the dead that were living in the, in the, in the collection. So they decided that, 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 they were, that by wearing the mask, they were protected. And their, their word for these uh, dead spirits that inhabit, that, that maintain this ongoing relationship with the objects is mecaron. And mecaron means literally image. It can, be, it can be used to refer to a dead person, a ghost, but it also refers to a human image such as a, 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 a human, a mask or a, um, a mask or a, a um, a, a doll representation of a human is mecaron, and also images, photographic images and video images are mecaron. And, and so the Kaipo word for, for video camera is also mecaron. So it's this idea that the mecaron is an image, uh, a ghostly image. And so um, in addition to the work in the museum exhibit, looking at the Kaipo objects and photographing them and recording them, the, the Kaipo were especially interested in learning how to make films. And they, they, um, they, they wanted, so we used the grant money to buy them cameras and to get them laptops and to do some basic training in filmmaking. And, uh, and at this point, there had been the original Kayako filmmakers that Terrence Turner had trained in the 1980s, but this is a fairly distant region. There, there hadn't been any real sort of direct contact with those filmmakers. Um, but they were very interested in getting the films and they, they started making their own films very quickly. And what was, what was striking is that, you know, I have, I've, I've taught ethnographic film before and usually you, you have your students go out and make a film without much instruction. They come back to the editing suite. They realize they can't use anything because it's filmed very poorly. And then they learn how to make a film according to the sort of standard uh, filmmaking techniques. But with the Kayapo, I sent them back to the villages with their first cameras, expecting they bring all this amateur sort of film with them. And actually what they brought back was really remarkable footage. And it seems as though the Kayapo, they were sort of, they were just natural filmmakers. There was something about their, the culture, these spectacular rituals that are done on a repeated basis and the color of it. And, and the, the fact that the entire village participates in these rituals and everyone knows um, what's going on in the rituals. So they actually turned out to be much better filmmakers than I could ever be because they understood exactly the, they, they understood the visual language of their own rituals in a way that, um, you know, even a trained filmmaker using our visual language can't represent it. And so I was really struck with the quality of their videos and uh, the production quality. And as I began reading up the, the anthropologist Terrence Turner, who had taken the Kaipo to New York, who had helped him get the cameras, he'd written about the, what he calls sort of, what, what he describes a video making aesthetic. And he, in his, his writings, he shows how when you look at the way Kayapo make films about rituals, that filmmaking process recapitulates the ritual process itself in the sense that um, you have these, 
you, the, the traditional concepts of beauty and, and truth involve transmitting ancient symbols and ancient patterns into the present moment and constantly updating them in the present moment through their repetition in the current day. And, and he identifies a number of aspects of the way the Kayako filmmakers were making films, the, the, the perfection and repetition of the movements, the, their, their ease with, in capturing circular motion, the way that they included all participants in a way that didn't truncate the film in any way, that didn't cut out any important parts of the, um, of the ritual. Um, he, he showed how their, their techniques of filmmaking are al an almost perfect reproduction of the ritual process itself in the, in the sense that it, and, and, and films have become the perfect way to record rituals because these rituals have a lot of social functions. For example, when people receive certain kinds of special honorary name titles, um, the, the name, and these are very important for Kaipo people as a, as a form of ritual prestige. And, and if, if the ritual isn't done properly, then the name doesn't have the value. It would, it would be sort of like in, in Europe when people, some noble people would buy their titles rather than inheriting them, they would be considered sort of less noble people because they bought their titles. And so if a Kayapo person receives a special uh, valuable name that wasn't done, wasn't received properly in the ritual, then that name loses its value. And so the, the act of registering these rituals provides, um, it provides proof that, that the ceremonial prestige that was conveyed in these rituals is, is valid. And so um, this, this concept of ceremonial prestige in the Kayapo language is referred to as nekre or nekrech. And many anthropologists have written about this. Um, it, it, nekre is a, it's a relationship between people and objects and prestige. And different anthropologists have referred to it as cultural, as sort of an equivalent of what we call cultural heritage. Turner described it as ceremonial wealth. And Vanessa Lee describes it as prerogative in the sense that um, when, when these things are inherited, these special kinds of wealth are inherited, they give the, the owners of them the prerogative to then pass them on to their family. And in, 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 in past times when the Kayapo were, were often at war with one another, um, they refer to these as the times of war, what they would do is they would, it, it wasn't really warfare in, the, in, in, in our sense of like invading a territory and taking over. It was really more raiding parties and the raiding parties would, would attack an Indian, a, a, a neighboring village or an enemy village and they, would, and they would take away specific objects. They would take away especially weapons, ornaments, names, and songs. And these are objects that, that the Kayapo, in Kayapo, Kayapo culture, these are important, um, they're important categories of objects and prestige that you capture for the enemies and then you incorporate into, your, into, the, into their cultural group through these ceremonies. And I was curious in the, in the uh, in the, when we visited the, the collections, when the Kayapo would describe different objects they found, they would always start by saying, this object here is not Kayapo. They captured it from their enemies somewhere. And, you know, as the, the, the people who, there, the anthropologists who knew the, knew the material objects said, well, actually most of them were very typical Kayapo objects. But the curious thing is that in their minds, an object has more value if it's not Kayapo. It's more valuable if it's a non-Kayapo object, it's an enemy object, that was captured in warfare and then incorporated into the culture. And so in, in current times, you can, see, you can see an echo of this concept in the Cre and this idea of cultural appropriation in the way that Kayapo have incorporated firearms, all sorts of trade goods, beads, um, maps, cameras, and computers. They all seem to fit into this um, cultural logic of Nekre, which involves capturing the songs, the names, the weapons, the ornaments, the technology of your enemy, reincorporating it through these proper rituals into your own culture, and then, and then displaying and using these, these things as trophies of war. So what we might call in the West cultural assimilation for the Kayapo is actually an expression of their culture. It, the, the fact that they're using video cameras and laptops, there's that famous Gary Larson cartoon of the, of the anthropologists coming, hide your cameras, hide your video machines. The idea that, uh, that that is somehow inauthentic, that indigenous peoples who use the technology are inauthentic. Whereas for the Kayapo, incorporating, capturing weapons, capturing technology, capturing knowledge is an essential part of their culture.
And so um, one of the first films that, that, uh, that was made was a really shocking, for, for all the anthropologists, it was a very shocking film. Um, it was a film made by, it was the first film made by the Kayapo filmmaker named Tatajiri, and it was of a Miss Kayapo beauty contest in a nearby town. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to pause my screen share now and play a short clip of this film of the Miss Kayapo beauty contest. So this is a film, it was the very first film made by this uh, Kayapo filmmaker, Tatajiri, of this really striking um, uh, beauty contest in a nearby town. And so just as a short summary, uh, the, 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 the five villages who are participating, it's, it's in a, it's in, a, it's in a small town called Orilandia, gold town, because it was a gold, uh, sort of a gold rush town. Um, it's a small town on the frontier, and it was, the, it, was the, it was the birthday of the city, and so the mayor invited the Kayapo to hold this ceremony, which is sort of the, what they call the Miss Kayapo Beauty Contest. And, and in the first bit, each village is, does a traditional dance and presents their candidate. And in the second part of the video, I'll show some clips of the, of the beauty candidates walking and, and, and doing the sort of uh, showing, doing the, the beauty pageant part of, the, of, the, of, this, of, this, um, of this beauty contest. So that's sort of the that's the the introduction to this to this uh, beauty pageant where each each village comes and presents its candidate and does a traditional dance. And then as we move forward, and you can see it's in the middle of a fairground with the with the, there's a rock band playing in the background and Ferris wheels and so on. And then as we move forward, we go to the uh, to the Miss Kayapo part. So, I mean, the first thing to observe is that this was the first 
this is the first time this young man had ever held a camera and had ever edited a film. And just the, the extraordinary quality of this for a novice filmmaker, just dealing with a very complex public situation like that, all this movement, all these people around everywhere, and just did an amazing job editing and sh shooting and editing this thing for a first film. But then you, as an anthropologist, you're sort of flabbergasted and, and you know, the, your first reaction is, oh my God, this is hor horrendous. This is this, this horrible perversion of traditional culture. You know, there are these, these young women, you know, mocking Brazilian models, waving their hips, you know, doing these sexy moves. It's this, sort of this very shocking kind of thing to look at. Um, but when, when we asked, when we asked the filmmakers, I asked Tatsuji, but don't you think this is, isn't this denigrating traditional culture? I mean, here you have these, you know, these young women imitating Western models. And he said a very curious thing. He said, we're showing the Kayapo women as beautiful. They're, they're, they're beautiful as Kayapo and as Brazilians at the same time. So in the Kayapo logic, this is not uh, an assimilation or a, or, a, or a perversion of their traditional culture. And as you can see, they, they made a very strong point of, you know, the first half of the, of the, of the contest was this traditional dance, each, each village presenting their candidate in the traditional way. And then the second half, they, they have their individual candidates doing the beauty contest. And so in, in a sense, whereas, you know, our outside perspective would be that, oh, this is horrible, it's exploitative, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's exploiting the, the, the sensuality of young women, um, but for them, it's their chance to, they sort of get to have it both ways. They get to be beautiful as, as Kayapo and as Brazilians at the same time. And I think this, you know, I've written about how this, the, the cultural logic behind this is not a logic of, uh, of, of assimilation or of cultural loss. It's actually the other way around. It's their way of conquering a space in Brazilian popular culture. And, and it has to go and it has to do with this, this concept of necre that I mentioned um, in that uh, this idea of capturing from the enemy these prestigious objects. And it's not just objects, it's objects, it's knowledge, it's even songs. And so um, um, the 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 you know, people, uh, the Kayapo subgroup that was that was basically, you know, went extinct in the early 20th century and the objects are still there in the museum, they were considered to be an extremely warlike people. And all, you know, the Kaipo, to this day, the Kaipo sort of have this, there's this uh, kind of um, awe towards the Adamurai, they were very feared warriors. And when, when I went back to the villages and showed them the videos and the photos that we've been doing with the Kaipo in the, in the museum and, they, and, and said, these are Ira Amurai uh, objects, one of the men in the village stood up and he says, you know, my grandfather remembers the Iran Marai because they were his enemies. And, um, and he taught us this song. And so he, he stands up and he sings a hunting song. It's a, it's a peccary hunting song. And, and everyone's laughing at it because it's the Iran Marai, it's, it's, a, it's a different dialect of Kayapo. And so things are pronounced slightly differently. And so he makes a big point of singing this, uh, this hunting song with these sort of, uh, this, this dialect with these different sounding words and so on. And everyone sort of laughed about it, uh, the, the pronunciation of the, the words being different. But what was curious is that the memory of this warlike group has persisted among the culture for over a hundred years. And, and, and the idea is that these feared warriors, um, yet this group of Kayapo that survived through the day had captured one of the Iran Marai songs. And so by, by capturing a song from this feared enemy and then transmitting it through the culture, um, it shows their power as, as a sort of, you know, we have survived and we've kept the memory of these, of these Iran Marai alive, these fierce warriors, and we can still sing their songs. And so there's this idea that songs captured from the enemies are a source of prestige. And reading up on this, um, there's a, there's, a, there's a story of another Kayapo group called the Kararao. And like the, um, like the Anamurai in the early 20th century, the Kararao were contacted um, in the late 1960s. And by the mid-1970s, when this, uh, this is an anthropologist at the Gelder Museum who, 
who basically documented the demise of this group. They were contacted in the 1960s, and by the late 1970s, the group was basically decimated by diseases, and, uh, and they were assimilated, and it basically went extinct as a, as a group. And so this anthropologist from the Gelder Museum wrote an article, The Extinction of the Kararao Kayapo Indians in the Lower Shingu. It was a region that was colonized very heavily. And in, 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 this, in this article, he makes this passing reference that, that, uh, that a friend of mine pointed out to me that, and this is, the Kararao were at the time, they were what we call today, quote unquote, uncontacted Indians. They were Indians who had not yet succumbed to diseases. They had not yet sort of succumbed to outside uh, influence and assimilation. They were living on their own. We, we would call them uncontacted or vo voluntarily isolated Indians. And yet, in the uh, Expedito Arno, the anthropologist, he observed that in certain rituals, the Kaipo were singing these songs that had very, very familiar melodies. And as he, as he, he documented, he realized that these were melodies of very, very typical common um, Brazilian folk songs, sort of like the equivalent of nursery rhymes in, in, in the United States. There's this whole tradition in especially Northeast Brazil where a lot of these immigrants were coming for the gold rush and for the land rush in the 1960s and 70s. Um, they're, they're sort of folk songs like the equivalent of, you know, um, she'll be coming around the mountain or banjo on my knee. They're that kind of really, really typical uh, folk songs from the Brazilian frontier. And he documented dozens of these folk songs. Um, there's a famous one called Mulher Rendera. Olá, mulher rendera. Olá, mulher renda. And you'll find, you know, hundreds and hundreds of covers of the song. It's a, it's a really classic Brazilian folk song. Uh, from the Northeast that artists, you know, children's songs and artists do different versions of it. And so these quote unquote isolated, uncontacted Kaipo Indians had learned all of these Brazilian folk songs. And one, you know, one, the, 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 the hypothesis is that as the women were out washing their clothes in the rivers, the Kaipo were sitting there listening to them and listening to these songs and, and they felt it was important enough, that there was these enemy white people who were there invading their lands. And yet in their culture, it was important for them to imitate at least the, you know, the melodies of these songs. And, and they were sort of trying to imitate the lyrics of these songs. And so and in certain rituals, when they would, rituals of warfare, the Kaipo would sing these captured war songs of, the, of their neighboring, of these neighboring Brazilian peoples. And so when we go to the next chapter of my presentation, about something that I call Kaya pop music. You know, we want to keep this idea in mind. Today, there's a phenomenon um, which I've called Kaya pop, and it is it is these Brazilian the, these Kaya po singers who who create Kaya po, mostly Kaya po lyrics to these very popular dance songs for ha, techno, brega, and so on. And uh, and in these in these public festivals. Uh, well, they'll have a, they'll have a the village will have a, an anniversary party or a, a neighboring town will have an anniversary party. There'll be a soccer match between villages and these, these Kaya pop singers will get, will, will, will present and sing these Kaya po pop songs. So now I'm going to play an excerpt. This is Bep Jude. He's a Kaya po man from, um, from the, from the, uh, the region of uh, Novo Progresso in Mato Grosso. And he is one of the more prominent Kaya pop singers. And I'm going to play a little excerpt from one of his uh, one of his uh, one of his songs. <laughs> Boy, can't tell 
You have this whole phenomenon of these Kayapo, um, what I call Kaya pop singers, these Kayapo pop singers. And uh, whereas, you know, again, from the outside, we might think of this as this, you know, this, oh, they're losing their culture, they're, you know, they're, they're succumbing, they're giving up their beautiful dance and, and, uh, and singing traditions to, to imitate the West. But if you look back in the Kayapo culture, culture, this is not losing the war, this is winning the war, this is capturing the enemy songs. And so now I'm gonna show you um, an excerpt. Uh, remember Mokuka? <laughs> Mokuka, the Kayapo filmmaker? Well, he's had this, uh, this twilight career in his older days as a Kayapo pop singer. And he came to this, um, this uh, on eight, April 19th is National Indian Day in Brazil, Indigenous Day. And indigenous, there's all through the country, there's celebrations of indigenous heritage and, and, um, and indigenous villages often have these, they'll have these multi-ethnic parties and invite different groups and they'll, they'll throw these big festivals honoring indigenous heritage, they'll have indigenous Olympics, they'll have soccer games and so on. And so Mokuka, this, uh, this pioneering Kaipo filmmaker, who's now a, uh, a pop singer, he came to the village and he remarked about how beautiful all the young women were. There, were these, there was this group of women on the stage with Dep Judy, sort of like the, 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 sort of like the Miss Kayapo style um, dressing, sort of blending uh, Western style, sort of sexualized erotic dress with the Kayapo ornaments. They were on stage with Dep Judy, and he decided to write a song about all these beautiful young women that he was seeing. And so what I'm gonna show you is an excerpt of a, it was a video that one of the, I wasn't even here, this was all done by them. Um, a Kayapo video maker named um, Krankrai filmed and edited this a video of this whole uh, celebration. And there's a section where he, he shows Mokuka singing the song, Te Mulher Bonita. The, the song means, basically there's lots of pretty women. And so he sings this song about how, and he very explicitly says, there's pretty women in the city, there's pretty women in the village, there's pretty young Indian women, there's pretty young white women. So the whole song, it's, it's a rare thing among Kayapo pop music and that it's actually composed in Portuguese. And so it's this whole song about appreciating um, beauty among women, sort of across, having it both ways. They can be beautiful as Kayapo and as Brazilians. And so this is a video, it's an excerpt of video that it, it's, it's, it's my, it's, it's kind of very meta here. It's my film of a group of Kayapo people watching the film that this Kaipo filmmaker made. So it's, I filmed a very short section of the people sitting around on a Sunday afternoon watching this. And they, were, they, they watched this video just for, for months and months, over and over again. They were fascinated to watch their own village uh, festival over and over and over again. And so I'm gonna show you a little excerpt of Mokuka singing Te Mulher Bonita. <laughs>
Bani ke jemit tau The curious thing about this was that that the the young woman who's dancing uh, alongside Mokuka, um, the Kayapo, especially the Kayapo men, were fascinated by this sort of uh, this very erotic dancing, which is typical of Brazilian. Uh, there, there's a whole style of Brazilian music called Ache, where each new song, there's a, and even funk today, there's a, each new song comes out, and the song is associated with a very specific often very eroticized dance by a, a woman. And then the whole sort of the song plus the dance becomes this fashion. And, um, and, uh, and so um, the, the, the men were just fascinated. Like they, they couldn't take their eyes off this young woman. And, and they said to me, she says, now she's the only one who can dance like that. No other Kayapo woman knows how to dance like that. And they said, she's from this village called Kubinkan Kren, which is this very remote village, way, way up the middle of Kayapo territory. And they said that they said that she sat in front of she had these videos that she downloaded from somewhere of these uh, Brazilian dance dancers doing these um, these ashe movements. Um, and they said she practiced for months and months and months to get it right. And and they were just sort of astounded. Wow, there's this Kayapo woman who can dance just like those Brazilian um, fashion models can dance. And they said she's the only Kayapo. There's no one else can do that. She's the only one. She she sat in front of a of, a, of some sort of screen in her remote village and practice for months getting ready for this, uh, for this performance. And so, um, it, again, it's the kind of thing that from the outside, it's easy to look upon it and say, oh, this, they're losing their culture, they're, you know, they're, they're exoticizing, they're, they're eroticizing their culture, this is horrible. But from the Kayapo perspective, um, there's this other vision that they're, that they're, they're capturing something and, and, and they're doing it with pride. And, and the song itself is all about, um, you know, how these Kaipa women, they're both, they're beautiful in the city and in, in the village. So they're sort of, they're projecting Kaipo culture out into the Brazilian, the, you know, eroticized Brazilian world. And now for this one, I'm going to ask everyone to just uh, uh, listen. And when you recognize it, raise your hand, okay? And we'll see how many people, how long it takes people to get this one. So that's right, you just heard the Kayapo cover of Hey Jude. I was literally leaving the village, getting my bags together, um, getting ready to cross the stream and go back, and I heard this sound. I was like, what? No, no, that can't be, that can be. So I, I sort of followed the sound. I had just like, I just had a cell phone with me. I followed the sound, tracked it to the, to the, to the, to the little hut where these boys were listening to it, and like, yes, I was listening to the Kayapo cover of Hey Jude. So, Again, within the Kayapo logic, we talk about the British invasion. Well, guess what? This is the Kayapo invasion. Um, so when um, there was a group of, um, of anthropologists, Saul Worth and jo John Adair, who gave uh, film cameras, old fashioned black and white film cameras to the Navajo um, back in the 1970s. And there's this project called Through Navajo Eyes. And the idea was that um, every culture would have, you know, when you, give a, when you give, a, give an indigenous culture a camera, they would create their own aesthetic, their own way of their worldview. We talk about anthropological worldviews. Well, that, that worldview would be expressed in this, they would have this unique way of making films. And a lot of anthropologists, and especially in the 1990s, um, very sharply criticized this idea that there could ever be any authentic uh, 
um, indigenous engagement with, um, with um, digital media or with film media. The idea being that all of these things, the cameras themselves, the production of the cameras, they're so intricately tied up with capitalism and, and Western media and, and news and manipulation that there's no way that indigenous people could ever overcome that cultural, that colonial cultural baggage that goes behind the production um, and the making, you know, the production of cameras and the making of films. And that the idea that there could be any such thing as an authentic indigenous film was ridiculous. But more recently, um, anthropologists among them, the leading one being Faye Ginsberg, who's worked with Aboriginal uh, Australian filmmakers. Um, she talks about uh, how indigenous filmmakers create this, this sort of hybrid culture where she calls it parallax, where you sort of like with, with, with stereo vision, you're sort of looking at indigenous culture and Western culture with these new eyes and you sort of get a new uh, three-dimensional stereoscopic perspective on indigenous realities. And she talks about the Fa Faustian contract where, you know, there's this contract with this outside technology, but is it going to give too much away? And so, um, uh, scholars working with the Kayapo, myself and others included, have said, well, no, there's no Faustian contract here. This is, this is, the, this has always been the Kayapo way of, of capturing the enemy's weapons and turning them against the enemy to defend their culture. Um, so um, when we look at this whole history of the Kayapo's engagement with digital media and film and pop music, even beauty contests, um, we can see that, I mean, all peoples are like this. All people are constantly changing. But somehow from the West with our sort of museological idea of culture, the idea is that, you know, we can change. We can change. We can get the latest iPhone. We get Twitter. We move on to the next social media platform. We're always changing. But these indigenous peoples, they're the ones who sort of always need to stay the same because if they don't change, they, get, they lose something essential about their material culture, about their culture, their songs, and so on. But, I mean, obviously, all peoples are changing all the time. And in the Kayapo case, specifically this concept of nekre and this idea of rituals is constantly bringing these past, these ancient forms into the present. There's something very unique and special about the way the Kayapo have engaged with, with these new forms of media as a way of, of um, transmitting their culture into the present and constantly reappropriating these outside technologies, but, but appropriating in the way that is uniquely Kayapo and that, that, and that is, that is, that is, um, that is, that is appropriated in defense of their culture. And so that the idea is that these, these appropriations, they're, they're not forms of assimilation. Instead, they're forms of a kind of capture, a cultural warfare where they're capturing these trophies from the West, from, from us, and using them for, them for their own means and within their own cultural logic to defend their culture. And in, in today's Amazon especially, um, we see that this, uh, this, this dynamism of indigenous cultures is essential for the, for the survival of the Amazon. Um, in the Amazon basin, um, you know, over half of all protected areas, national park, all categories, national parks, forest reserves, um, indigenous reserves, if you add them all up, more than half of them are indigenous reserves. And uh, in, in Brazil particularly, indigenous areas are more than five times the total area of national parks a million square kilometers of indigenous lands. And um, scientific studies have shown that these indigenous reserves are, if not the same, they're actually, they're perhaps more effective than parks, um, strictly protected parks in stopping deforestation and, and forest fires. And um, you can literally look, I mean, it, you know, with, with the past, especially the past year and a half in Brazil with this changing, this new administration in Brazil, which has opened up, um, uh, it's sort of given a green light to um, illegal foresters and, uh, and land grabbers and gold miners um, to just, just, a, just a blank check to invade indigenous lands. And uh, the, the, the image below is a panoramic image of the Kayapo village where I first started working, which has since been invaded by hundreds of gold miners and they've destroyed you know, thousands and thousands of hectares. Of, this is, these are forests that I used to go fishing with the Kayapo fishing and hunting in these same areas. And now they're just destroyed for the rest, you know, for, you know, for hundreds of years, they've been completely destroyed. And so, um, you know, way back in the 1980s, 
Daryl Posey, who was a, a well-known anthropologist and ethnobotanist who worked with the Kayapo people. And he was one of the people that helped the Kayapo um, get to New York and organize against the Bella Monte Dam music, he figured. And he, in, in, the, uh, in the first International Society of Ethnobiology meetings in 1988 in Belen, the same city where I work, um, he, they, they, they did a, a declaration, the Declaration of Belen, talking about the inextricable link between culture and biodiversity, that, that um, today biodiversity, um, you cannot protect biodiversity without protecting cultural diversity. You can't, intact, you can't protect um, animal species without protecting indigenous cultures. And recently in, in 2018, we had a the 30 year reunion of the Belen uh, Biodiversity, of the Belen Ethnobiology Conference, and we released a new updated Belen Plus 30 uh, Declaration of Belen. And so we see through these 30 years of, um, of, Kayapo, of Kayapo people's culture, um, there's been this strong, um, this strong, this strong uh, warrior ethos that has motivated them to, um, to, you know, back in the 1980s, from th their use, the very self-conscious use of their image, of their painted bodies, their headdresses, their, uh, their warrior image, you know, facing off against these, um, against these Brazilian authorities with the machete. Um, and then, you know, over the years, uh, this conscious use of video cameras as a weapon to protect themselves, and all the way up to this uh, Nere Camoro, uh, Kayapo chief just a year ago, um, learning of the Bolsonaro, as, as indigenous people were just being exposed to Bolson, the, the Bolsonaro government in Brazil's uh, depredations and, 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 uh, and, and threats to indigenous culture, she stood up and said, if he st keeps talking like this, I will cut his mouth off. And so the Kayapo have been very savvy in their use of, of their own image and of, of, of Western technologies uh, to confront these threats. And this is an image of the of the of the Shingu region where the Kaipo indigenous lands are located, and you can literally see the border of the Kaipo territory on satellite images and on aerial photographs. You know, everything to the left of that image is cattle pasture, and that 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 specific line, that tree line that you see, that is the geographical boundary of Kaipo territory. Because um, you know, at least until last year, um, people respected those pit territories because they knew the Kaipo would you know. Crack, crack some heads and people come in. But now under the Bolson and Mato administration, you've seen this massive uptick in deforestation, in, um, in, uh, in, in illegal gold mining and so on. And, and th so, so this, the dynamism of these indigenous cultures like the Kayapo is something that's not just important for their cultural survival and well-being. It's, it's important for the entire Amazon basins, the entire South American continent, the entire world survival. Because um, if anything, the past couple of years have shown us that all the, the climate predictions that were being made, you know, 10 years ago, five years ago, if anything, there was always sort of the, you know, the, the, the conservative estimate and then the worst case scenario estimate and sort of intermediate estimate. And what we found over the past couple of years is that what we considered the worst case scenario estimate five years ago is turning out to be the conservative estimate today and that things are moving much faster than anyone ever thought. And, and people fear that the Amazon basin could very quickly approach a tipping point where all of that, all of that carbon that's been stored for you know, thousands, you know, perhaps millions of years in these trees, tens of thousands of years to be sure, um, if things continue going in this direction and deforestation doesn't stop and the, the rain cycle is interrupted, all of this, all of this forest could start suddenly turn into this huge um, bunch of kindling, and the forest dries out and suddenly goes up in flames. And if you know, if this if this sort of status quo isn't stopped, we could see over the next hundred years the Amazon being reduced to something like fifteen percent of its current size. So that is the end of my talk. Um, I, I'm I, I thank you for uh, putting up with this remote uh, access. It's sort of a new thing for all of us, and I look very much forward to your questions.